Is there stuff or no? We forgot it. No, it should be. That's good. That's good, yeah. Otherwise, I thought I would try to throw something in there about using the tiger. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, let's have a seat, guys. Check. Let's grab a seat. Let's go over our, our bulletin really quick. And um, all right, cool. So we have um, for you ladies. Well, actually, next next Sunday happens to be my wife and I's wedding anniversary. Eight. 18 years, right, babe? Honey, she's gone. She's not paying attention. She, or she doesn't care. I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, 18 years, right, honey? I want to get it right. Yes. yes, 18 years. 18 years. So, but we're going to celebrate with you guys too at the Super Bowl party at George and Kathy's house. And so, there's a little uh, insert in your bulletin for that. Um, with the address and, and stuff there, if you need to sign up to for what you're going to bring, sign up. It's there. And then also, um, see George for your tither seats. And that is that. Turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, as we're going to continue in our study of the gospel of Luke. There's so much in it. I don't want to like breeze over it. I don't want to, um, you know, rush through it. So I'm just going to take my time through the gospel of Luke. Maybe we'll be there until Jesus comes. The way things are going on this planet, he should be here at any moment. <laughs> like, um, it's just going to be exciting when he comes. And, and, and I pray that we're all ready. We're all ready to receive the Lord. The story is told about a farmer who had a problem. Someone had been stealing his melons. And so one day the farmer had a bright idea to put outside of his farm a sign. And the sign read this. It said, one of these melons is poisoned. And so for a few days... You know, the farmer had peace. The melon thief stayed away. But then one day, much to his chagrin, he went outside to his front gate to check on his sign. And there, the sign had been crossed out. And where it once said, one of these melons is poison, somebody now changed it to, two of these melons is poisoned. And now the farmer had no idea who poisoned his melons and he lost his whole crop. Satan is a lot like that. He's a master deceiver. When you think you have him figured out, he's got one up on you. When you think that, that, that you've got victory or you think that you've got something, he's coming at you in a different direction. Because that's just the way he works. He's been at this from the beginning of time. There in the Garden of Eden, there when he began deceiving Adam and Eve, he was there. And trust me, he is a professional. He is a master at deceiving people. And he will, you, you will not outwit him. You will not outsmart him in any way in your flesh. He's much more powerful than you. He's much more cunning than you. He, he's much more witty, wittier than you. He's much more smarter than you. He's much more deceptive than you could ever be. He's very powerful. So we've come to this powerful section in Scripture where Jesus himself teaches us on how to overcome temptation and sin. And I've titled this Bible study, The Strategies of Satan. 
There's a really, really great book, by the way, that you can read. It's a small little um, book. You can read it in an hour or two, maybe. Um, it's called The Strategies of Satan by Warren Wiersbe. And it's such a powerful, powerful book because it, is, because it is there that you get a really good biblical perspective on how Satan works in your life and how he schemes and how he does things to trip you up. Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, or Luke chapter 4, I'm sorry, gives us great insight to combating the schemes of the devil. Because the devil will always, as I said, will always be wiser and smarter. But God has given you his word. God has given you his spirit, which makes you way greater. Alone by yourself, you have no chance with the devil. My father was actually telling this story um, a couple of weeks ago where we were um, having lunch and we were talking and uh, we, there is, we were talking about how when I was growing up and I, as a kid, we lived in Cerritos and I was walking home from school one day and these guys, these high school kids across the street um, threatened me for no reason. They just saw this really, really cute little kid and they just said, you know what, we're going to mess with him. And they threatened me and they said, hey, don't walk down this street again. It's the street that I live on. What are you talking about, Willis? Right? Don't walk down this street again. If you ever walk down this street again, we're going to beat you up and blah, 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 blah. Well, I remember I was so afraid. And I was like thinking, what am I going to do? Um, because I have to walk up and down this street every day to come and go to school. And I said, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go tell my father. And I went and I told my dad. And my dad grabbed a baseball bat and walked over there and threatened the tar out of these guys. And I never had a problem with them ever again. <laughs> my dad stood up for me. And you know what? When we know and when we understand that we have Jesus and that we have the Holy Spirit, the Bible says that the demons tremble at his name. Do you understand that? Satan has no authority over you. A lot of Christians give Satan too much room in their life to work. Satan has no authority over you. He has no power over you. The only power he has is the power that you give. But he has He's, his, his teeth have been pulled out. He's been defanged. He's been declawed. He really can't do much. Satan can only tempt you. That's all he can do. But he needs your cooperation. That's all he can do. He can tempt you and tempt you and tempt you, but he needs your cooperation. He can't make you sin. There is no such thing as, oh, the devil made me do it. No, he didn't. He tempted you, and then you gave in. Jesus gives us really good insight here in Luke chapter 4 on how to combat the enemy. When the enemy does tempt you, when he does present something before you, there is a way out. Paul gives us insight to this in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, where he says, No temptation has overtaken you except such as common demand. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but will, but with the temptation will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Paul says, there is nothing that you're tempted with that none of us are not being tempted with as well. No temptation has overtaken you such as common demand. There are three areas that we're going to look at that, that Satan usually goes over, usually attacks us in these ways. And every single one of us go through it in every single one of these categories. And you know what? I believe firmly with all of my heart that Satan lives by the old adage that says, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So he's like a master fisherman, right? 
He knows what works on you. So he baits his hook and here, psh, insecurity, here, fear, here, lust, anger, whatever. And he puts that on the bait or on the hook and he throws that bait. And guess what? If you bite it and it works on you every time, he's going to use it every single time. But God is faithful, it says, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able to take. Satan can't do anything without God's permission. We see that in the book of Job where God, he, Satan has to go to, to, to God and he has to ask for permission to touch and affect Job's life. And God says, okay, you can do this, but you can't touch his life. He only gives him so much. He can't do things to you without his permission. When he does that, he says, God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able to take. God knows that nothing is going to come into your life that you just can't handle. He knows you can handle it. Maybe you don't know you can handle it, but God knows you can handle it. And so God, with that temptation, always makes a way of escape. Always. You know what the problem is? Sometimes that temptation is so great, and sometimes it comes at you so quick that you might know the way of escape right away, but sometimes it's just, it, it hits the flesh so hard and you just know that, man, your flesh wants it. It wouldn't be a temptation if your flesh didn't want it. And sometimes we're just not looking for the way of escape. Or sometimes the way of escape is there, and we don't want to take the way of escape. We want to please our flesh at the moment. We want to feed it. God will always offer the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So when the temptation comes... My friends, look for the way of escape every time because it's there. God is faithful to put it there for you. He doesn't leave you hanging. So we all have our moments of temptation, but understand that whatever you're being tempted with is something that your fellow man is tempted with and you are not alone. That's one of the greatest lies that Satan puts in your mind, that you're the only one that is going through this, that nobody understands what you're going through. Nobody gets you. That's a lie from hell. Many other people are being tempted and going through the same struggles that you're experiencing. The lie that Satan, the reason why Satan puts that lie on you is to keep you quiet. If he can keep you quiet, it's like that child molester that molests a little boy and says, hey, this is my secret. This is just between me and you. Don't tell anybody. And now that little boy lives in fear or that little girl lives in fear. And now they don't stay, they don't, they don't, they can't enjoy life. And now they're just trapped and they're in silence or they threaten them. And they say, if you say something, I'm going to kill your mom or your dad or your brother. They say something wicked like that. When Satan tempts you and he says, just keep it to yourself. It's like him being that child molester. He's trying to just absolutely destroy you and ruin you. So stay quiet, he says. God says, no. Speak it, confess it, deal with it, get it out. No longer allow that to have its grip on you. And the moment you confess it is when Satan's hooks come out of you and you're free. You're free. James gives us some insight to temptation he says in James chapter 1, verse 12 to 15, he says, Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. And then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. So first, James says that you are blessed when you endure the temptation, because when you have been approved, you will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised. 
when the, when the enemy comes and you stand firm and you stand in righteousness and you say, no, you've been approved. God says, good, good. You can withstand that. You have to learn to withstand that because it's going to get harder. The enemy is going to keep coming. Two, he says that God doesn't tempt us because God cannot be tempted by evil. God doesn't tempt you. Satan does. God is not tempted by evil, nor does he tempt you, he says. So you can't blame God. So don't. Three, he says that each one, this is a, this is a good one. Okay, this is something that you need to understand. He says that each one is tempted and drawn away by their own desires and enticed. See, your desires and my desires are not the same. We might have things in common, but they're not the same. Satan draws you away by your own desires, and he entices you with that. We all have these different things that work on us, as I said, but you also have to understand it's taking responsibility for your own heart. You have, as Jeremiah says, a heart that is deceitful and desperately wicked and who can know it but God. We all have this dark side to us. We all have this part that's imperfect. We all have this, this heart that God needs to work on constantly, that he's making more like him. And so he says, Hey, I am going to draw you away by your own desires. Those desires, they're your own. They're not God's. Makes it very clear right there. You're drawn away by your own desires. And so those things that are your own and that are not God's and that are sinful, those are the things that you need to start confessing and dealing with in your heart to the Lord. Those are good. Those are good things. I would say those desires are not good, but it's a good practice to begin to deal with that in your heart towards the Lord. And lastly, number four, there is a downward progression that gets worse when it comes to sin. He says there uh, in verse 15, then when desire has conceived, it brings, it gives birth to sin and sin when it is full grown brings forth death. The desire conceives a thought. The, that thought will conceive an action if you feed into it. That action will give birth to sin. That sin will give birth to death in your life. It will kill your joy. It will kill your peace. It will kill, could kill you physically. Drug addicts, alcoholics, Dodger fans. <laughs> it, it will kill you. It'll kill you eventually. It'll ruin you. It just does it. Okay? You can't get away with it. It's a downward progression of sin. It only gets worse. But it starts, have you noticed when temptation, it starts with a thought? I love the barbecue. I'm really looking forward to next Sunday. Because I love the barbecue. And you know what I love? I love marinating steaks. You know why I love marinating steaks? Because they taste so much better. At Thanksgiving, I make the bomb turkey. I brine my turkey. I brine the turkey and I submerge it into this solution, which I won't reveal my secrets. But I submerge it into this solution and ask my mom. My mom made turkeys all my life. And she tells me, oh, your turkey's good. My dad tells me your turkey's good. Everyone tells me your turkey's good. I'm like, yes, thank you, Pinterest. Right? But listen, I, I, I marinate the turkey and I marinate the meat. And you know what's going on in my mind the entire time that meat is marinating? Oh, I can't wait. I can't wait. It's going to be so good when I put that thing on the grill. It's going to be so good when that thing comes out of the oven. It's going to be bomb. It's going to be awesome. Well, sin is the same way. You begin letting your mind marinate on certain thought lives, certain thought patterns, a certain situation, a fantasy, a desire, a this and that. And the more and more you think about it, it begins to marinate in your mind. 
And where it once was wrong, it is now sounding better and better and better and better. And when that thought gives birth to an action, you commit sin and now you're in trouble. See, the enemy is not stupid. You got to get smarter. You got to understand. That's why Paul would say, take every thought captive. The moment those thoughts begin to pop into your mind, take it captive and say, no, I submit that under the authority of God. Take it. No, get out of here. I don't want it. I'm not, th- I'm not going that way. I'm not thinking that way. No, take it and give it right to the Lord. Take it captive. But we get our greatest insight from Jesus. And now in Luke chapter four, here we are. Remember last week, Jesus had just been baptized. The Holy Spirit descended on him in the form of a dove. And the father responds by opening up the heavens. And he says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And then verse 23 says that he went on and he began his ministry at the age of 30. And now we're here at chapter four. Have you ever noticed that when you have a great mountaintop experience with the Lord, that Satan comes and tries to rob and ruin that, right? It's what Jesus said in John 10, 10, that Satan has come to rob, to kill, and to destroy. That's what he does. He's come to rob, to kill, and to destroy. That is God's, I mean, that is Satan's heart for you. God's heart for you is, Jesus says in that same verse, he says, but I have come that you might have life and that you would have it abundantly. Satan's heart is to rob, to kill, and to destroy. God's heart is that you would have life and that you would have it that much more abundantly. It's very clear. Okay? And so Satan comes to rob. And when you have that mountaintop experience with the Lord, he wants to rob that from you. I've seen this many times throughout my Christian walk as I've gone and I've gone to retreats and getaways and this and that. And I've had just a wonderful time. I'm up on the mountain just being blessed and just being just meeting with the Lord and the Lord meets with me. And it's just, he gives me a word and he speaks to me. And then I have to come down the mountain to reality down here. And all of a sudden, boom, right away, temptations, trials, whatever, heartbreaks, whatever, things begin to happen because the enemy just does not want you close to the Lord. So in verse one, we see this. It says, Luke chapter four, verse one, whoops. It says, then Jesus, filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness and being tempted for 40 days by the devil. And in those days, he ate nothing. And afterward, when they had ended, he was hungry. Duh. (laughs) He hadn't eaten for 40 days and 40 nights. Of course, he'd be hungry. But listen, it says this. The first thing that I point out is that the Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. This is very interesting. He's now filled with the Holy Spirit, The Holy Spirit is now leading him out into the wilderness to be tempted. Now, the wilderness in the Bible is always a place of testing. Okay? In the Bible, the wilderness is always a place of testing. You might feel like you're in the wilderness in your life. You might feel like you can't see the light at the end of the tunnel. You're having problems. You're this and that. It is a place of testing of your faith and your obedience to the Lord. Listen, Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 2 says, And you shall remember. Remember, who was leading Jesus into the wilderness? Who was leading Jesus into the wilderness? The Spirit, right? The Spirit was leading Jesus into the wilderness. Listen, Deuteronomy 8 2. Where the Spirit came from. God, you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all these 40 years into the wilderness. Why? To humble you and test you, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. The wilderness is to show you where you are with the Lord. It's not for God to see where you are with him. He knows your heart. 
It's for you to see where you are with him. When he leads you into the wilderness, it's to show you if you will obey his, to test you, to show you if you will obey his commandments or not. Will you just get all mad at God and grab your ball and go home? I can't stand you, God. Because people do that. I've heard it many times. But God desires to really form you and shape you. It's a time of testing. And if you have that type of attitude when you're being tested, then God is showing you that you need to mature spiritually. Listen, this year, 2018 has, was, as you guys all know, was one of the roughest years. And trust me, when I was being tested in the wilderness, there was many times I wanted to grab my ball and go home. If it wasn't for two couple of good friends of mine, Pastor John Schaefer and Bill Buffington, and David Trujillo, these guys literally talked me off of the ledge of quitting ministry many times. Because I felt like throwing in the towel. I'm human just like you. But we, or I'm sorry, but I had to learn how to grow. I mean, I'm still learning how to grow in my faith with the Lord, how to trust Him. I don't believe that the Father allowed this as some sort of test to see if Jesus would be obedient. But I do believe that he allowed this to show us in the next couple of verses and to give us an understanding of how to combat Satan when he attacks us. Understanding something <clears throat> understand this, I should say. You and I we are not tempted by Satan himself. Jesus was being tempted by Satan himself for 40 days and for 40 nights. I don't think you or I are tempted by him. I don't believe that he wastes any of his time with us. <laughs> he goes after the big guns, right? He, 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 I believe he just reserved himself for Jesus and he went at it in heart. But Jesus gives some insight. Luke tells us that he fasted for 40 days and for 40 nights and he ate and drank nothing for 40 days and 40 nights. He denied his flesh to be obedient to the spirit. In other words, he slapped his flesh into submission to the spirit. There's a great story in Matthew chapter 17 where Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up on a mountain. And, and, and there he reveals himself. He peels back his skin and he reveals his glory, so to speak. And it's the Mount of Transfiguration. Okay, And Peter says, Lord, maybe we should just build three tabernacles. Stay here. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Because Moses and Elijah appeared next to Jesus as he's revealing his glory. Oh! right? He's there, just peeling back. And there he is. There's an inner God just coming out. And then they go down the mountain. And when they get to the bottom of the mountain, there is a father pleading with Jesus. My son is demon possessed. And, and, and I brought him to your disciples and your disciples couldn't do anything for him. And Jesus says, oh, you of little faith, bring the boy to me. And Jesus cast out the demon and the boy is healed. Then the disciples come to Jesus privately and they say, Jesus, why is it that we could not cast out this demon? And Jesus says, because this kind, this kind can only come out but by prayer and fasting. There are certain issues, certain battles, certain struggles in your life that have such a foothold, a stronghold in your life that a simple prayer every day is not good enough. 
He wants you, the Lord says, this kind can only come out but by prayer and fasting. He wants you to seek him a little bit more. You need to deny your flesh, you need to deny yourself, and you need to press in and fast and seek God for deliverance and for victory in this area of your life. Period. End of story. That's the whole purpose of fasting. It's to get victory in your life total victory in your life, but it takes a little bit more than just the norm. He wants you to press in and seek him more. Hebrews chapter four, verse 15 says, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. So there's nothing that you and I go through that Jesus himself doesn't understand. And there's nothing I that you and I go through that Jesus himself didn't have victory over. So when you feel like I just can't get victory over this, Jesus says, I did. And my spirit lives in you. So yes, you can. Don't believe the lie of Satan. He's lying. Jesus was fully God and fully man. So he can relate with all of your fleshly struggles. And he never sinned. He lived the perfect life. For us, he had full victory over sin. I love what Pastor Greg Glory says. He says, Jesus lived the perfect life to pay a debt that he did not owe because you paid a debt that you could not pay. He did that for you. Romans chapter 6, verse 14 says, we went over this last week, It says that sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Okay? There's no sin in your life that can have dominion over you because he conquered sin and death on the cross and in the grave. He gave you complete, total victory. So sin should not rule over you in any way. Don't let it. Do you think the devil went easy on him, though? No. No way. Look at what he does. Verse 3. Verse 3, then he says, And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. And but Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Satan attacks Jesus in three areas happens to be the same three areas that he attacks us that I mentioned earlier, and I'm going to break it down. He attacks us in these three areas. 1 John chapter 2, verse 16 says, mentions the three. It says, For all that is in this world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of this world. Okay? So the three areas are the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Those are the three areas, the main areas, okay? And so here in this passage, Satan says, command these stones to become bread, the lust of the flesh. He says, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become bread. Jesus hadn't eaten for 40 days and 40 nights. Of course, he was going to be hungry. And let me ask you something. Have, Have any of you guys ever been to Israel other than me? Okay. Israel is covered with rocks. (laughs) Jesus could have made an entire bakery if he wanted to. It's, It's rocks everywhere. Jesus, find the biggest rock. Make the biggest, you know, pan dulce you want to make, Jesus. Fill yourself. 40 days and 40 nights you haven't eaten. If you are the son of God, you know you're hungry. You know you want to eat. Have it. Go ahead. Command these, command this rock to become a bread. Oh, you know, you know, it must have been incredibly hard. But he said no. He said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Jesus quoted Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3, happens to be Deuteronomy is uh, 
Jesus quotes Deuteronomy the most of any other book in the entire Bible. Most of the time when he's quoting scripture, he's quoting from Deuteronomy. So he says this in Deuteronomy. Food is what you need to survive physically. Jesus knew that. Can't go too long without food. You can't even go much. You can barely go. Well, I don't know how many days you can go without water. You won't last too long without water. And, and you, you can last a little bit longer without food, but not too long without water. Jesus knows that you need food physically. He created your body that way. Some of us, we eat too much food and the wrong kind of food, right? Take care of yourself. Be wiser. But listen, the word of God is what you need to survive spiritually. There are many, many anorexic, starving type Christians out there. Because they're not in the Word. There is no healthy diet of the Word of God in their life. And so they're spiritually anorexic. They're spiritually weak. And there's no victory. Romans 10, 17 says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You want to increase your faith? You want to increase your walk? You want it to be better? You want it to be stronger? Faith comes by hearing and by hearing the Word of God. Faith is a spiritual muscle that needs to be exercised to get strong. But how? Through hearing the Word and more importantly, being obedient to the Word. James says in James chapter 1, verse 22 to 24, it says, don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourself. Ouch. He says, for if you listen to the word and don't obey it, it's like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself walk away and you forget what you look like. So it's be like that person that gets up in the morning goes to the mirror, sees the eye cheese, sees the hair all out here and everything, the mascara all over the place. And you just look like Marilyn Manson, right? And you just bad, right? And then all of a sudden you look and you see yourself, you know your breast stinks, you know you got stuff in your teeth and you didn't brush your teeth. And you look in the mirror and you go, you got white heads and all this stuff. And you look in the mirror and you're like, all right, I look good. And you go outside the door. There's many blemishes and things that need to be taken care of. I, I don't want to embarrass her, but Gabby's a makeup artist. Gabby helps cover blemishes. She does that for a living. And she makes what looks horrible look beautiful. I've seen her work. Follow her on Instagram. She's good stuff. But listen, it, it, there's many blemishes, right? And there's magic that needs to happen. But spiritually, we can do the same thing. Spiritually, we, we, can, we, can, we, we can see the junk in our lives and then just think that we're okay and walk out the door. And God says, what's wrong with you? you? You can't just be a hearer of the word where I point this out to you and then not do it. You're deceiving yourself. Don't just be a hearer of the word, but be a doer of the word put feet to your faith and live it out walk it out be real be real christians i, I was paid a wonderful compliment yesterday I, I got to speak at this conference at, at calvary first love and there was a brother that was leading a, a worship and and i was saying goodbye to pastor john and this guy tells pastor john he's like hey uh, pastor john that's his church and so he goes hey pastor john he was shaking my hand he's like i i like this guy and John is one of my best friends. And he goes, yeah, I know. I like him too. And he goes, no, no, I like him. He's real. And I, I was so blessed by that. Because it's one thing that I don't want to ever be is just be fake. I want to be real. If I love you, I tell you I love you. If I don't like you, I tell you I don't like you. If, you're, if you do something that blesses my heart, I'm going to tell you. If you walk in and sin and you do something, I'm going to tell you. And, and, and what your response is to me, it, it is what it is. And, and, and if you don't like me, I'm sorry. 
but I am more concerned with my relationship here and not so much here. If I have this here right, then all of this will be okay. You just can't please everybody, but I'm more concerned about pleasing God. And when he told me that, encourage. And listen, I would encourage you to be the same way. Be a real Christian. Be real. Don't be fake. Be not just a hearer of the word, but be a doer of it. Look at verse 5. Then the devil took him up and revealed to him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Uh, I'm reading from the wrong translation. Then the devil took him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, all this authority I will give to you and their glory. For this has been delivered to me and I will give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you worship before me, all will be yours. He takes him up on a mountain, shows him all the kingdoms of the world, and Satan says, Jesus, if you, I will give you all of this if you would just bow down and worship me. This is the lust of the eyes. Ooh, ooh, ooh. What does Jesus place, be- I mean, what does Satan place before you? It says here, check this out. Gaze into this. Look into this. Go off into the, this direction. I will give it all to you if you bow down and worship me. Listen, here's something. Satan is like that, that used car salesman that's trying to sell you that, that car that looks good on the outside, but on the inside is a piece of junk. He, he, he's telling you that it's just, it, it's, it's, it's not, it's like next weekend, you're going to see at the Super Bowl, you'll see all these Super Bowl commercials and beer commercials and this and that. And you see all the attractive people dancing and having fun on the beach, drinking their Bud Lights and yada, yada, yada. But you don't see, and they're always young people in nice shapes and bikinis and all this stuff, but you don't see the out of shape dude that's an alcoholic whose life is destroyed, his wife is leaving him, his kids want nothing to do with him, his marriage is, is just completely ruined, and, and he's lost everything. They don't show you that guy. That's what Satan does. And here he's showing Jesus all the kingdoms of the world. And he says, hey, I'll give you all this if you just bow down and worship me. Here's the crazy thing. I don't know if you've ever looked at it like this, but this was shown to me a while ago when I was going through some counseling, personal counseling. And this was, this was very powerful. Satan tried to acquire worship through Jesus at this moment. And he offered him everything to get the worship. Jesus said, no, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. So what's the next best thing for him? He goes after you. He goes after me. So he tempts us. And when you give in to the temptation, this is crazy. When you give in to the temptation, he acquires worship through you and your sin. That's how he gets it. So, surrender your heart completely. Worship the Lord your God. If you're going to worship something, make sure it's the Lord only. Because, listen, you become a slave to that which you worship. Didn't Bob Dylan sing a song or something like that? You got to serve somebody, right? Something like that. I'm not a Bob Dylan fan, but I know I heard that before once. He, he sang a song, you got to serve somebody. Listen, learn balance in your life, always keeping Jesus first. And when something grabs hold of your heart, and it's not God, surrender that quickly. Let's wrap it up. Verse 9, then the devil took him. And brought him to Jerusalem, set him on the pinnacle of a temple and said to him, If you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you. And in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you 
Dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered and said to him, It has been said, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Lastly, he tempted Jesus with the lust of the flesh, tempted Jesus with the lust of the eyes, and now he's tempting Jesus with the pride of life. The pride of life. There is a very ugly element of pride that comes with testing God. Jesus says, you shall not test the Lord your God. Don't test him. Don't test him. You parents, you understand. When your kids are testing you, what do you warn them, right? Don't test me. You, you don't want to go there. You don't want to because I'll ground you or I'll have to discipline you. Or this, or don't test me. Be obedient. You'll be blessed. Obedience brings blessings. Don't go there. Don't test the Lord. There's an element of pride that comes with testing God because you think you're above judgment or you think consequences will not apply to you because of your foolish decisions. You're wrong. The wages of sin is death. Do not be deceived, it says. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. The, 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 uh, what was a quote? Oh man, it was a great quote. Uh, the wheels of God's judgment, the wheels of God's judgment roll slowly, but grind thoroughly. When God begins to work and God begins to go down and you test him, the wheels of God roll slowly, but they grind thoroughly. It was God's judgment. Rather, I would tell you, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. He has shown you, Micah 6, 8, right? He has shown you, oh man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you is to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. I have nothing to be proud of in my life. It's in my own flesh, I should say. I know the type of person that I, that I am. I know what God has saved me from. I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not, I don't boast in my past. I mean, I have nothing to boast in. I boast in the Lord. Everything good that I have in my life, every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of lights. He's given me my three boys. He's given me my wife. He's given me my wonderful parents. He's given me everything good in my life is because of him. He is the author of good gifts. And when I receive that stuff by grace, man, I, I, I see, I, I, I'm just humbled. I'm humbled that God would even want to use me. I'm humbled. I'm humbled every week. When I come here, I'm humbled. Lastly, Verse 13, and we're done. And Jesus answered and said to him, oh, I'm sorry, now when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until another opportune time. The New Living puts it like this. It says, now when the devil had finished tempting Jesus, he left them until the next opportunity came. What a jerk. If he's going to mess with Jesus, if he had the gall, if he had the audacity to mess with Jesus, do you think he's not going to mess with you or me? He will. And guess what? 1 Peter 5, 8 says that he roars, he, or he prowls around like a roaring lion. New Living says, looking for his next victim to devour. To him, you're nothing but a victim. And so he's prowling around looking for that next opportunity to go after you. So that's why Jesus said, hey, be wise as serpents and gentle as doves. Be wise. Be wise. Be smart. Uh, 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 Pastor Poncho said, uh, live your life like a gecko. Because their eyes go like this, right? He says, you got one eye on Jesus and one eye on <laughs> down here, right? Live life like a gecko. You're here and you're doing this and you're looking because it's the truth. The enemy doesn't stop. 
Don't ever get comfortable to think you can put your guard down. What happened to David when he put his guard down? He sinned with Bathsheba, right? He took a break from the war. God didn't tell him to take a break from the war. Went up on his roof, relaxing, look, and he sees Bathsheba taking a bath, a beautiful woman, and he's the king of Israel, and he says, give me her, I want her. And then he fell with her. And then he tried to cover his sin. And it just got worse and worse and worse. That's what the enemy does with your life. Be careful. They are the strategies of Satan. Get hip to his strategies and understand what works on you and say no more. Say no more. I, I, I know what you're doing. I see it. I see it. I'm not going there. I'm not listening to that lie anymore. I'm not going to allow you to do this to me anymore. I have victory. Amen and amen. Father, thank you, God, for your word. Thank you, God. And um, I just pray that you would help us to be a people that are refined in you. Lord, there are things, God, that just need to be renewed in our lives. Perhaps it's our mind. Perhaps, God, it's our hearts. Perhaps, Father, it's just um, that we need to confess something. Thank you, God, that you are ready. Be ready, God, to... <clears throat> to receive us unto yourself. You're ready to forgive. You're ready to renew us, Lord, as we confess. Lord, you don't want us to be hindered in any way. Lord, you want to make us wiser and sharper to the schemes of the enemy, Lord. And so I just pray, God, that you would um, have your way in our hearts. We're fine with God. We're fine with As we sing this last song, I, it's my prayer that um, you would make it your prayer. That you would... Um, You can hear the words and that you would make it your prayer and that the Lord would just uh, refine you and renew you. You would see how much He loves you and that He wants you just to be pure. You can see his reflection in you.
Father God, thank you. Send us forth from here, Lord, refined, renewed, refreshed, equipped to battle the enemy. Understanding his schemes, Lord, and Father, I just pray you'd fill us with your spirit. Send us out of here full. In Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. God bless you guys.